Have you ever played Hearts of Iron 4, The New Order, and played around with the Burgundian system, and then decided to make Russia into a Burgundian system? And then you had Sergei Tibaritsky as a leader. I decided to do some deep digging into Sergei. This man is wacko. But I can tell you one thing. From all the drama that happened with the frontier and TNO itself, Sergei had a skill in him to root out the degenerates and to shoot the father of the man who made Lolita. Before we get into the biography of Sergei, I do want to talk about this assassination. Sergei fought in World War I in the Caucasian Cavalry Regiment. While there, he made friends with someone called Pyotr Nikolaevich Sibelsky Bork. During this time, Sergei was a monarchist. Both Pyotr and Sergei wanted revenge for what happened in Russia and what happened to the royal family. And they decided to take the revenge on a man called Paul Milikov. By accident, killed Vladimir Nabokov, which is the father of Vladimir Novakov, the writer of Lolita. A general picture of the assassination attempt was given in the latest news on the basic of detail describing what happened in the Berlin newspapers. The lecture entitled America and the Restoration of Russia, which Nilakov delivered in the full hall of the Berlin Philharmonic beginning 8.30 and ended 10. After graduation, Milikov went to the side of the presidium intending to sit down in his place. When he appeared at the presidium, Shebelsky Bork, who was sitting in the third row, stood up and began shooting at Milikov. Dr. Asnes, who was sitting on the podium, threw Milikov on the floor, but Shebelsky Bork jumped onto the podium and continued shooting. Then Novakov rushed at Sabliski, hitting him in the hand, in which he was holding a revolver. At the moment, Dobretsky opened fire on Novakov. Panic assured in the hall as part of the audience ran to the exit. The word of Sibisky Bork were heard, I avenged the royal family. Novakov was instantly killed by a bullet in his heart. There was no other wounds on his body. Was transferred to the art room. Tobolevsky calmly went to the wardrobe and taken his clothes, went to the exit and a woman shout, Here is a murderer! And Tobolevsky was detained by the crowd. Tobolevsky was sentenced to 14 years of hard labor for complicity in the assassination attempt and deliberate infliction of severe wounds on Novakov, which caused his death. Both of them were released ahead of schedule and continued their political activism in Germany. In the background you might have heard a weird clocking sound. That is now the anthem for Sergei. I will now show a video that perfectly explains how Russia would have been if Sergei took over Russia. Links in the description and on screen right now for the full video and the account. So except this assassination, what else was interesting with Sergi? <sighs> well, not that much. All right, so Sergi has a few interesting times. You know, the assassination, and then he actually punched another person from the Duma. So his life is filled with events, but him as a person actually isn't all too interesting. The interesting person here is actually his friend. That man made everything happen for Sergi. If it wasn't for that man, Sergi wouldn't even be in the history books. So Sergi became friends with Zablesky during World War I, and when he fought in the cavalry together. During the fighting in World War I, Sergi and his friend got imprisoned in Russia, which later was taken over by the Germans, the land the prison was taken in. And the Germans find a liking to Sergi and his friend. So once the army went back into Germany, they followed. And with that, kick-started Sergi's life in Germany. Now, it's very important to remember, because they transferred to Germany without any legal right, 
Sergi did not have anything with him. So he didn't have his birth certificate. So he was a stateless man in Germany. And this caused a lot of problems for Sergi. So when he came back to Germany, he tried to help it. He wanted work. So he tried to do a taxi driver, didn't work. He tried other sort of back and forth jobs, he didn't work. And he found work in far right newspapers, mostly as a typewriter or doing some translations if necessary. But Sergi and his friend during this time wanted to change who they were. Sergi was actually a Russian Jew, which is, which is, which is an irony in and of itself. But yeah, he was a Russian Jew, but because he didn't have the birth certificate, they could never check that. So when, so after a few years being in Germany, he got himself a, a legal status where he can write what he was, and he wrote there Russian Orthodox. And he also tried to describe himself as pure Aryan. And this was before the Nazi regime in Germany. This was during the Weimar Republic. But he also knew that he could get more standing if he was of proper racial definitions. But during the time where he was stateless, he tried to marry a woman. Didn't work because if he marries a woman, she also becomes stateless. So it took him 17 or 20 years to get proper paperwork. And by that time, the Nazi regime was in power. And that was actually why they allowed him to get the papers in the first place. Because the Weimar Republic would have never given him the papers. But the Nazi regime saw sort of a use for him. And the use they found from him was because of his friend. <laughs> Again, Sergi isn't actually that important. His friend is. Sergi is just the right man at the right time. So Sergi worked because of his friend in a migration office, making sure that Russian migrants to Germany got settled or got rejected if necessary. And during the Nazi regime, they took over and they tried to focus on white Russians, as they called it, more purer Russians. Because how early state Nazi Germany saw the migration to Russia, they didn't want to replace them. Like they knew a lot of people would migrate because of the war, but they did not want to kill them. The idea was a lot to eradicate the Reds, but not the people. So they were in war with the communists, not the people. And Sergi during this time found a lot of luck because of this. Like he knew he spoke Russian, for easy time speaking to the new people coming. And there was a lot of, and there was a lacking of Russian translators in Germany during the time. The NSDAP decided to actually indirectly hire him to make sure that the right Russians came to Germany and also so the Russian could help translate. So he wanted uh, Sergi to find Russians to send to like Czechoslovakia or a few other places like that so they could do translations. All of this was kind of indirectly because Sergi had a fascination with the Germans, with the Nazi Germans. He wanted to become part of the NSDAP, but it was not possible. They didn't want him. He's a Russian. He's weird, but he's useful, but he's weird. So eh, let him, but indirectly. So throughout most of his life during that time, he was just, you know, indirectly doing a lot of work. And this is how you have to see him. So people usually romanticize this guy a tiny bit, thinking he'd done a lot. Like, oh, work for the Gestapo. Ooh. No, I mean, yes, but no one liked him. He was a very unlikable creature. No one trusted him. Like, I should tell you the reason why he got out of prison. It was actually because there he did what he should. He has follow orders. Every day he wrote a letter to his little Fraudelein and he behaved very well. So, you know, he got out. But during his time in the migration office and working with um, the Russian immigrants, no one liked him. Like the only reason why he got very high up in the immigration office is because his boss was a Freemason. So there had to be, you know, can't have Freemasons. But otherwise, <laughs> no one liked him. He was very unlikable. I should also tell you that he took over the youth group. He was a youth group leader for Russian migrants to Germany. Uh, maybe once, maybe once he was actually there. He hated children. He hated them. He, he might be a leader. He might 
have to do the work with children, but he never did it. Could never ask this man to work with children. He, he didn't want to. So other people had to do it for him. He just got the position because of bureaucracy. So yeah, that's the story of Sergei Tovarezky. Um, actually, not that interesting man. He did a lot of dirty work that no one wanted to do. And with dirty work, I mean sitting in an office writing. That dude was a writer. Like, that's what he did. Like, I think his friend actually claimed that uh, he himself did not like office work. But Sergei just, you know, he just did it. He went every day to the office. Type, 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 type what they had to do, and he went home. So, you know, he just worked perfectly within the bureaucracy. He did everything correct within the bureaucracy. The dude is just very clever when it comes to paperwork. <laughs> he isn't, he's is no, he's a pushover. And in the sense, maybe that he's a regent in TNO actually fits him. Because the dude isn't, again, he's a pushover. He's a, he's a side character. He's a, he's a right-hand man to some higher up, usually. Not, not really that interesting. He just did what other people told him to do. And he simped for his little fertile line. That's about it.